you have any help with anything, then just please ask. I'll be hanging around and I'd love to do that for you. Uh, they've asked that we begin with prayer, which I really appreciate that about the Tea Party, that they uh, want us to invoke the presence of God. So would you join with me as we do that before we begin tonight? Our Father, as we join our hearts in prayer, we thank you so much for the opportunity of living in the greatest area, the greatest state, and the greatest country on earth. And Father, we thank you for the freedom of expression and for each of these candidates who has uh, put themselves out front and offered to serve in this community in any way that they can. And Father, we pray that tonight there would be a spirit of civility, a spirit of unanimity. Father, we pray that there would even be the presence of Christ himself in this room. We pray, Lord, for each candidate that they would be able to express themselves clearly and make their positions known. And then give the voters wisdom and discernment to know how to follow your direction. Thank you, Father, for tonight the opportunity of freedom in this great country. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please uh, stand as we say our pledges to the United States and Texas flag, beginning with the U.S. flag. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's our Texas flag. Ready? Begin. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Gary Louie, Will Metcalf, 
Jason Millsaps, and Dr. Ted Siegel. Simply passing new taxes and throwing money at a problem is not the answer. In fact, it's hampering economic development. Every month, Gina and I have to balance our budget at home and on our businesses. We are forced to set priorities and focus on those issues that are most important to our families, our businesses, and our future. I want to apply those same common sense principles as your state representative. I too would like to thank my wife and her support. Kathy is sitting back there and many of our, our supporters that have come tonight uh, to hear this. My name is Please go. My name is Gary Louie and I'm a candidate for state representative district 16. I'm a native Texan, born and raised in San Antonio. I've been a business owner and resident of Montgomery County since opening an automotive repair established in 1979. Like many of you in this room, we have a belief of paying forward. While establishing my business, I dedicated free time to community involvement, volunteering and taking on numerous leadership roles with public and nonprofit entities. After the sale of my business in 2001, I have focused my attention on supporting nonprofit organizations that have been founded in Montgomery County and serve the needs of our citizens. 
I've been instrumental in identifying and helping Montgomery County citizens who need a helping hand during rough times. My leadership efforts have provided transportation and nutritious meals for senior adults, self-improvement opportunities for junior high and high school teens, after school child care for families holding down multiple jobs, and high quality accessible health care for working families. During this forum, we will talk about qualifications. Each of us can claim being qualified based upon some educational, training, or professional situation. I suggest that you listen for the term experience. Of all the individuals that have indicated an interest in this position, I have by far the greatest breadth and depth of experience in all the areas that are important to being a successful representative in District 16. I have demonstrated successfully business management as a small business entrepreneur, assuring that my employees receive their paycheck each week. Community leadership, serving on boards such as the YMCA, United Way, and the Chamber of Commerce. And serving the public as an elected capacity, taking responsibility for public budgets and public service. As Mayor of Oak Ridge North and during my tenure as, as a town center board member, I dealt with similar issues at the municipal level that the state is facing today. I address these concerns effectively and efficiently. I've been in the forefront of coordinating solutions for problems for many communities. There are many examples that we can go into by working with TxDOT and the realignment of exit and entrance ramps uh, during the reconstruction of Interstate 45 that benefited the businesses at Oak Ridge North, solving drainage and flooding problems by working with the Texas Woodlands Development Corporation and redesigning waterways to flow west to east rather than through, than through Oak Ridge North, negotiating with the city of Houston on some extraterritorial jurisdiction needs uh, that, that allowed us to resolve the merger of the city and the utility district, as well as prote protecting against Houston's encroachment of large cities in their tax and, and fee structures. Also was the lead in, in creating a water and, and sanitary sewer system for the community of Tamina. There was a landmark Texas water development project that allowed $3 million in grant money uh, for that project. A person cannot gain experience simply by growing older. Experience is an evolution process where the person is seasoned by being on the front lines of decision making. As your state representative, I will be your ambassador in Austin to assure that the voices of our local communities are heard and all state resources are available to address our needs. Thank you. Mr. Metcalf, I'm sorry, we're just going out for order. I should have asked you to sit that way, but we'll figure it out. Yeah, my name is Will Metcalf. Happy to be here tonight. Uh, beautiful wife Megan and my mother are right over there. Thank y'all for being here tonight. Wow, it's wonderful. It's emotional to me to be in this room tonight. I grew up in this church. I remember playing basketball in this very room and coming to youth group. The stage was not here at this time. This is new here, but it used to be right over there, kind of where our sign is. But it's so nice to be in this room where I grew up. And Pastor Mark, thank you for having us here. And thank you, Montgomery County Tea Party, for hosting this event. <clears throat> It's a great honor and privilege to come from my family who've been here for six generations and I hold this community very near and dear to my heart, which is one of the reasons why we're running for this campaign. I appreciate y'all all being here. I serve on many local organizations and committees and boards, including the Conroe Industrial Development Corporation, the Greater Conroe Economic Development Council, the Montgomery County Fair Association Board of Directors. I serve on their Livestock Auction Committee. I'm the finance chairman of the Conroe Industrial Development Corporation. I've, I'm assistant vice president of commercial lending at Spirit of Texas Bank. I know what it takes to have a business. I have a business of my own. I know what it takes to make payroll. Uh, it's, business is important to me, and I plan to bring a new generation of conservative leadership to our state legislature.
time. And uh, no sense. If you can have that. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out for us tonight. Uh, it's nice, lovely, cold weather. Um, my name is Jason Millsaps, and I am running to represent your voice in Austin as your next Texas State Representative. I strongly believe in representative government, and I will work every day to ensure your voices are heard in Austin by all Texans. We are very fortunate to live in the greatest state in the nation. Our state continues to drive the economic recovery of our nation, and of our nation, and without us, it would be at a standstill. Texas has created more jobs in the last four years than any other states combined. And with our prosperous economy, no wonder more and more Americans and their companies are moving to our great state. One of our greatest challenges lies ahead of us as a state. Our debt and local debt is going to be detrimental to our future generations. Debt today equals taxes tomorrow. I want to assure you here and now that I will not support any increase nor propose any new taxes. I will not support any legislation that will force our local governments to raise capital by creating a new debt in order to comply with also. I will exercise fiscal constraint and keep our children's mind, excuse me, keep our children's future and minds at all times. I am a strong supporter of a child's right to life, the Second Amendment, and property owners' rights. I will stand up for Texas, demanding that our federal government recognizes the Tenth Amendment, and I will defend us from the federal government at all costs. We need someone in Austin who shares our conservative values who will work with other legislators standing up to the federal government saying enough is enough. Like you, I've had enough of the federal government and I will be the conservative advocate you need in Austin fighting every day for our children, our community, and our future. The American dream is a powerful thing. People from all around the world have left everything to come to America for the American dream. Today our generation is slowly watching that dream fade. As politicians have been killing the dream for so long now, Americans have lost touch of what the dream really looks like. The American dream is laid out in every page of our Constitution. It, along with the Bill of Rights, allows us to live in peace and prosperity, free from the fear of persecution and from our own government. My goal is to restore the American dream by keeping the government out of the free market system and ensuring the Constitution is followed with every decision that I make. Ladies and gentlemen, I will stand up to the Democrats who wish to trample our Constitution and the values it holds within. I will engage all those in my own party who feel that the Constitution is a hindrance on their ability to govern. And I will not forgo my conservative principles just to fit in with the crowd. Instead, I will embrace them, and I will defend our state and federal constitutions down to my last breath. My name is Jason Millsaps, and I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. Thank you. And an opening statement from Coach Seekin. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I just want to recognize Representative Brandon Creighton, who has represented us so well. I think everybody up here on the stage would certainly like to applaud him. I don't think he's here tonight, but let's at least show our appreciation for Brandon. And if it wasn't for Brandon, we wouldn't have to be up here, right, gentlemen? <clears throat> Yeah, we love we love him so much. We love Montgomery County. Everybody at this table, we have a lot invested in what's happening here in this beautiful district. We, I tell everybody around the state that we live in the Garden State uh, of Texas, and we live in the Garden County of Montgomery County, and we just happen to live in the Garden District of District 16. Now, I know if you're in 15 or 3, you have other opinion, but we really are passionate uh, at this uh, at this table, these men, about representing you well. And tonight, I. I'd be glad to answer questions. I want to do that, but I want you to get to know me because you may not know uh, Ted Sego, the the man, because I've been a little busy raising a lot of kids up on Lake Conroe. My wife and I have been married for 35 years, and we've lived here in the district for 16 years uh, now, and so it's exciting to be able to to raise our kids here and to have those uh, five married children produce uh, uh, 10 grandkids as well. And you may know my oldest son, John Sego. He is the legislative director. For Texas Right to Life, he was the original author of the Sonogram Bill and the Preborn Pain Bill, along with uh, the Omnibus Bill and uh, finding those funds to take away from Planned Parenthood. So I've been very active with him, with he and uh, the Texas Right to Life folks in getting bills passed over the last six years, the last three sessions, and also stopping some very, very bad bills. I've lived in Austin a lot. Uh, as a patriot, as a citizen of Montgomery County, and as uh, someone who is concerned about, about life, I've served as a pastor for 39 years and uh, thousands of families. 
and I've literally seen, overseen millions of dollars in budgets. So I'm very comfortable serving as a public servant. I've been doing that for a long time. And I'm really part of the Black Robe Regiment, which you're hearing more and more about, men and women that are standing up for Christian values and principles that we want to return to government. And no longer will our pastors be silent, but we need to have our pulpits come alive to share the values that we find in Scripture. And this is our state, and we want our state to be founded upon those principles. Uh, I pastor a church that votes 95 to 100% every election cycle. And that's very impressive for, for many of you. That you I think every church here, every church here should be in that same particular. We've got to get the faith vote out to retake our country. We believe that citizenship and discipleship go hand in hand. I've been an educator for 25 years. I have a bachelor's and master's degree. Yeah, you're right. I, I do have a lot of degrees on the law. I have a doctorate of education as well. And I've been in education for a long time. I'm a headmaster and I'm a classroom teacher and I'm a college professor. So I really have a heart for education. Uh, my wife will graduate with her doctorate degree uh, in May. Congratulations, Johnny. Right. I, like so many guys up here, we, we own a small business. We've owned it for 23 years, and I, I've worked in, with hundreds of employees as well. We understand that dilemma. Uh, honestly, I've got to be honest with you, folks. I was not planning, planning to run for office. I was planning to be a patriot and a citizen in Austin, continue to support great candidates like we have up here on the stage and also to support men around our, our, our state as well. But I was asked, I was lobbying last spring, we spent a lot of time helping get HB2 passed in Austin. I was there, and Texas Supreme Court Justice John Devine came and asked me to run, to consider running when we heard that Brandon was gonna to run for our cultural commissioner. Reverend Dave Welch came and asked me from the Pastors Council in District 15. Steve Toth came and talked to me about running, and Texas Right to Life president approached me, and all these men separately, and I was encouraged by run to run, by other state representatives and many state and local leaders. So I'm just so blessed to have so many endorsements and you can go to my website and see that because why? I've been in Austin a lot <laughs> representing you unofficially but representing the values that we hold true. And I, I know it takes a lot of time and effort to read the bills and I have bills here tonight for you to look at. They're, they're, they're huge, it's a difficult uh, mindset. I was there with Brandon to help him unload his boxes and pray over him and ask for God's favor over his campaign and his service as our representative. And he's done a great job. But because of that, I do have a lot of endorsements. I realize that there's nothing that can take the place of being in Austin, walking the halls, trying to get a bill from being written to calendar to out of calendar to committee to committee uh, hearings and then get it to the point where it's actually going to the floor, being debated, fighting off amendments and then getting it passed. That's how hard it is to be a legislator. And those are things that I've been working about. I close with telling you that my campaign is about faith. I live every day, Coral Dale, before the face of God. And that's what every Christian leader should be in our nation. My life is driven by biblical principles. And I feel like there's a standard that we need to have for our lives that as is, candidates. That is and time. It's for me. That's, that's the time. Okay, very good. I don't see the time. Very good. Thank you so much. That's good. Thank you all. And so we'll continue to around the medical order. And since uh, Mr. Ham opened, the first question will be uh, first for Mr. Lewis. Each member will ask this intern, and we'll, uh, we'll help with the alphabetical stuff, and y'all help me too. And so uh, we're blessed to live in Texas. We love our state. I know everybody here does. And uh, uh, Texas is to America in many ways what America is to the rest of the world. It, it's uh, the land of opportunity. That's why people are coming here. And we're, we're going to talk about some of those reasons tonight. One area that we're first in, that we're near the top of the list, we're not as proud of, is in the area of property taxes. We rely heavily on property taxes to fund our, our public education system in Texas and other uh, government functions. And so uh, we'd like each candidate's position on property taxes. And, and if you'd like to get rid of the property tax and move away from it, what would you recommend? So what do we do about property taxes? And what would your alternatives be? And uh, Mr. Little, we'll start with you. Uh, can we clarify the how much time is thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so we have, so we're going to have two minutes to answer. Each candidate has two minutes to answer a question. And if y'all been given those uh, rebuttal cards, a couple of those to use. If after you've answered the question, you feel like you got to say something else, you can use one of those cards to get one more minute. All right, but y'all, we each get two minutes uh, for each question. And who's the Yeah, we just can't see anything. Uh, we can't. Yeah, you'll we'll be, uh, you'll, you'll have some experts here helping you with the time. But you have two minutes for each question. And so the first one's about property taxes. Would you advocate moving away from property taxes? So how, how would you replace it? 
Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Thank you. I'm, uh, oddly enough, I was speaking with uh, our local tax assessor collector today about property taxes, because I know in the, in the Republican Party uh, principles and platform that they advocate uh, eliminating property taxes as a means of fairness to all property taxes or replace it with a level of um, sales tax. My question of, of um, the tax assessor collector was if there was any numbers that had been driven um, by the powers that be to, to replace every property tax that that we now get every October and do every January related to uh, school districts, municipalities, special special districts, uh, and the such. I, I would support replacement of property taxes, but I think we need to drill in very closely to see what that, that replacement tax is and how our local entities are able to uh, manage their budgets uh, in that regard, your phone shut off. <laughs> and so in that regard, I would, I would dare say that we'd have to find out whether a sales tax of, of 14 to 20 percent is agreeable to, to the average resident. If, if we're going from what is now eight and a quarter percent to something that's two times or two and a half times larger. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Okay, you can you can take that one next on, on property taxes. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I don't like property taxes any more than anybody else does, but uh, that is a source of revenue for us to keep doing what we're all used to. Uh, I will tell you this: I will never, ever, ever vote for a state income tax. So that's something that will never fly when I'm in the state legislature. And. Uh, Keeping with alphabetically, so uh, Mr. Millsaps will hear from you next on property taxes. We'll get used to this. Thank you, guys. So on property taxes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a problem with property taxes currently. Uh, they they're high across the state. The school districts are extremely high, uh, and they're they're not utilizing that revenue properly. But in order to do away with property taxes and to go to a more neutral revenue stream of, of uh, sales taxes, we would have to double our current sales taxes which would ultimately hurt businesses say what? Uh, sales would go down, the economy would fall just because of adding taxes to, a, to an item that we already purchased. And I stand here today to tell you that every Texan, no matter if you own a property or you rent property, you pay property taxes. It's, it's already fair. You pay that through your rent, you pay that through your mortgage, you pay that directly to the county or the entity that taxes you. I say we leave that alone, add no new taxes to the state, and let's maintain our current revenues and find savings throughout the, the state of the county. And Dr. Siegel, what are your thoughts on the property tax? Sure, if you're listening to Barry Smitherman uh, talking about the growth in Texas where we're adding 1,300 people a day to our state and that we're growing at a 5% uh, rate per year, we're gonna have certainly more property taxes as we're building more revenues. I was meeting today with the Houston Area Realtors Association. We talked about this issue uh, on how that could be very stifling. In Texas, you know you don't own property, really. You, you have a deed to a property, but it can be taken away from you because of property taxes or liens placed upon that property. So as we're talking to legislators around the state, everyone is interested in how can we uh, more equitably look at paying fair tax. But with the projection that we're growing over the next five years, uh, we're looking at an opportunity for us to actually lower property taxes. And I, I know that's a, that's a crazy thing to even think about. But when you think about Montgomery County, the incredible explosive growth that we're going to be facing here in the coming uh, years and across our state, we know that we are, again, the districts, the, uh, the beautiful state that everybody wants to come to. We know that people are moving here quickly. And with that comes revenue. With that comes development. And so I think it's something we need to visit, especially as legislators, uh, locally and on the state level to see what we can do to lower and to look at finding ways that we can give those savings back to property owners. Hey, Mr. Hamm, if you'll uh, close us out on property taxes. You've been right. Let me just clarify, if we're talking about the uh, 
property taxes as far as on the education side or the real property taxes that we're paying? Because it's kind of a twofold deal. Well, you know, it's up to you. Uh, the biggest piece of our property tax, of course, is that uh, uh, local that uh, school, tax, school taxes. But there's others on there, so you just take it as you see fit. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, our property taxes, are ta we're taxing our seniors out of our homes. We we've got to change some stuff fundamentally uh, for our seniors. Uh, when you're my age, then a lot of times you can pay your property taxes, but our seniors today sometimes get taxed out of their homes, and I have a problem with that. I think we need to do something in the state of Texas to ensure that our seniors continue with regards to property taxes. Uh, I'm thinking we can dwindle that down. Uh, our school taxes, they've already found out that the Robin Hood program, as far as, as, as how we distribute our school taxes, is unconstitutional. So that, there's a change coming. Um, and, and I would be in favor of moving some things to where people aren't just taxed to death on their, on their property taxes. Uh, but, but again, the school taxes is the highest deal. I would look at very seriously about moving maybe over into the consumption side of things when everybody's paying um, and not getting taxed out of their homes. But I'm saying all options are on the table. But we're going to have to do something. Thank you, Mr. Bill. you want to use a rebuttal card on that? Okay, go right ahead. That would help him. <laughs> it's not so much a rebuttal as an, an addition to what I was saying. Our uh, our tax rates in in the county and counties across the state have gone down. And and when you hear that, you think your taxes have gone down. Well, unfortunately, your appraisals have gone up. So your actual tax bill has increased year over year. I say the legislature legislature needs to uh, cap these appraisals to the current rate of inflation statewide and put a stop to these 12%, 14% appraisal increases year after year. Mr. Ram, you have something else on that? Well, I was just gonna add, they are capped at 10% uh, right now. They can't go over 10, they can't raise you up over 10% right now and one wife on, on your program. That's right. 10% for residential, no cap on uh, commercial, but for, for your homestead, that's 10%, that's right. That's the, that's the current level. All right, gentlemen, thank you. The next question, we'll start with Mr. Metcalf. And while we're talking about uh, fiscal matters, let's talk about the state budget. It's the uh, one the bill that has to pass uh, during the legislative session. Uh, it's pretty big. It's getting bigger. We don't expect uh, candidates to be experts on it, but it is uh, something we're going to have to deal with. And so uh, tell us uh, if you think the state budget needs to be cut. What areas would you cut? Be as specific as you can. And uh, Mr. Metcalf, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to see us start at a zero-based budget. Uh, you know, my wife and I, whenever we review our budget from uh, years previous, we don't look at what we spent last year on utilities and say, hey, let's up that 10 bucks or whatever. That's kind of what the state legislature does now. They start at X and say, we're going to increase it. So zero-based budgeting starts everybody off at zero. And everybody has to come to the table and say, why do we need this? So I'm a fan of zero-based budgeting. Another thing is I would not have voted for this past budget. I believe that there were ways that, uh, there are areas that we could have cut. Uh, personally, there's always going to be areas where we can tighten up the belt. And Mr. Millsaps, uh, you're next on that question about the budget. First of all, with the, with the state budget, I would immediately look for ways to cut waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, the Texas Department of Agriculture has within it a program that sends inspectors into our retail grocery stores to inspect for broken eggs and remove them before a consumer can purchase those. That adds uh, $750,000 to our budget every year, so $1.5 million per biennium. I think consumers know when to buy eggs and when not to buy eggs. I think we can eliminate it immediately. I mean, the Texas Land Commissioner oversees uh, Veterans Affairs in the state of Texas. The governor also appoints a board to do the exact same job, which costs the state $3 million per biennium. I would allow the land commissioner, who's selected statewide, to deal with that issue directly and completely eliminate the governor's appointed board to save that $3 million. And I would go after any other facet of our state budget that includes waste, fraud, and abuse. It's, it's rampant, and we can save millions of dollars per year just going after that before we look to cutting actual programs that are necess a necessity for our state and our future generations. 
Dr. Siegel, you want your thoughts on the budget? Fellow Kansas schedule. I agree, and I, I have a copy of this uh, year's budget right over here on the stage if you want to see it. Uh, it's about this thick. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Uh, Hughes, I'm sure you've read every page of that, right, sir? Every page. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we know um, in the state of Texas, it's amazing um, the different areas that we're funding. And we found this out when we were trying to find funds, uh, those funds for Planned Parenthood, uh, two sessions ago. To move those to other agencies and we begin to find all the agencies that were cutting funds uh, because of uh, as uh, we were talking here with Mr. Metcalf as he was mentioning the zero based budgets uh, zero based budgets is a really good idea in theory uh, but you would not you would be there an entire year trying to get that budget passed so one proposal on the table with the legislators uh, that just adjourn would be to do a portion, a portion of the budget every session, every two years, and start zero base with them so we can get the budget passed. And as you know, if you've been following, the budget was one of the last things that was considered. Uh, there were so many areas and questions that we had to really try to look at and see what we needed to move around, what we needed to add to. Education, we had to get refunded because it was defunded some the year before. Talking with all the, uh, the administrators in our Montgomery County and Willis uh, School District and Conroe Independent School District, it's amazing how much uh, that cut did to remind them where money comes from and how they can better utilize the economy. And so our, our districts, I'm happy to say, I'm going to meet with those superintendent of schools. They're, they all agree that it was a good exercise and it's very much like a zero-based budget. You've got to look where the money is and where it can, it can be spent. So working as a legislative team, you, you're looking at those areas that are obvious and those areas we have to take care of. And there's certain, certain things that are fixed, really only one third of the budget are things that we can really consider. We can maybe address that in another question. Okay. And uh, Mr. Hamm, your next call. Stop me. <laughs> one of the first things that I would go on, our, our largest line item budget is entitlement programs. And we just picked up another 100,000 people in the state of Texas into the Medicaid program. And Texas didn't take the Medicaid expansion. Uh, we have got to get people that are able to work, working. And I'm not talking about our seniors that are drawing some kind of entitlements. I'm talking about working people. We've got to get them back involved and in working instead of being a drone. You can't just quit. It's like unemployment. You know, we're at 99 weeks, you know, right now in unemployment. Well, our entitlement programs are open ended, and, and, and we can whittle away at billions of dollars with our entitlement programs with the state budget. It's the largest line item we have. Now, the education might cross it, but education is also uh, supplemented by the federal government. So if you took the federal government funds out of, out of education, uh, I think Medicaid's our largest line item budget. And Ms. Lou. The um, biennial budget is, I believe, $200 billion. And, and the difficulty is that the state continues to grow. We are a destination for tens of thousands of people each year and the services we need to provide as a state continue to grow. So it's not likely that we cut our budget, but I think we can make some thoughtful decisions about what is necessary to provide those services. I think it'd be difficult to start with a zero-based budget because there are certain programs that we are obligated to to provide, and so that establishes your benchmark of where your budget is. But I, I, I believe in sunset provisions and look at bureaucratic uh, areas that need to be um, uh, allowed to sunset, I think, uh, as uh, Jason suggested, that we, we, we investigate and we take a harder line on fraud. Um, and then we have to set our priorities. We want, as we talk about moving money from, from uh, one area to another, if, if we're taking money out of, say, for example, the fuel tax to, 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 to pay for roads, we're taking that money from education. We have to set priorities as to where those monies need to go. And if we're taking monies from, from Peter, 
to pay Paul, how are you going to make sure that, that Peter is held whole? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm glad that, I'm glad you guys don't like the budget. You know, Mr. Craig voted no, Mr. Toe voted no. I voted no, by the way. Uh, a lot of members this time voted no because the budget was so big. In fact, the largest number of members from the majority party voted no on this budget than at any time I can remember. So we that we're on the same page. Oh, yes. That's a little rebuttal on that. Go ahead. Right, we appreciate you uh, leading the caucus toward voting against that budget, uh, Representative Hughes. Uh, let me just give you some numbers. $59 million uh, for health care and $49 billion for public education, $16 billion for Department of Transportation, $20 billion for higher ed, TD, uh, CJ is $6 billion, four for general government, DPS $1 billion. Comes up to $197 million. In there, you know everyone in this room understands there, there are plenty of opportunities for us to find ways to, to drop our budget. And I think as legislators, we get caught, or they get caught, uh, watching you, uh, Representative Hughes, try to get toward the end of a session and you're having to pass bills and get things funded because of the time restraints. It all goes back to the Speaker of the House and Lieutenant Governor. Those bills have got to get out of committee early and they've got to get on the floor so that we can look at budgets and begin to make intelligent uh, decisions on which areas we need to go after. Thank you, Jim. While we're talking about the budget and looking at different areas, one uh, line item in the budget that for the last few sessions has been a lot of scrutiny has to do with economic development. We all agree we want jobs, a job is better than any government program. We're all for that. We recognize that states are competing for jobs, especially expansions and large manufacturing operations. Different states are jockeying for a position. They're bribing manufacturers to come there versus other places. Now, it seems to me when they narrow down to Texas versus Louisiana or Oklahoma or Arkansas, that's not really a hard decision. Nevertheless, nevertheless, some of these companies are like, making tough calls. So, should the state budget, should we take tax dollars and spend that for economic development, for incentives to bring companies here? Is that a good use of state money that's uh, going to provide jobs? Is that corporate welfare? Is that picking winners and losers? We'd like your thoughts on uh, use of tax dollars for economic development incentives at the state level. And we'll start with Mr. Bill Sapps on that. Quickly answer your question, no. Uh, I think uh, we've done enough to drive the economic uh, magnet that Texas is for other states and the businesses across the nation. Uh, and my question is, for that money, what do we get out of it? Are, are we taking in hundreds of thousands of new jobs or tens of thousands of new jobs? And the answer is no. For, for the money that we spend, we get a few jobs, and they're not guaranteed to stay here until forever. They're, they're, they're guaranteed to stay here while we've given them a tax incentive to be here, and then they can uproot and move somewhere else. So I say we continue to do what we've done as a state, keep our taxes low, keep our budget in line, keep uh, the climate for business there so people will come here on their own if they want to do business with us. Now if, they, if the state wants to spend a, a tad bit of money to uh, fly to other states and, and, and talk to these businesses, that's fine, but that we're not talking about billions of dollars being spent in tax abatements to draw these people to uh, these, these companies to our state. I think we, they come here on their own wanting to work and do business. Dr. Siegel, your thoughts on state funds for economic development incentives? Oh, sure. I mean, I think we know that, that Governor Perry, along with our legislators, have created a really positive environment for businesses. Uh, I see Representative Creighton here. Uh, we know that those guys have worked careful to create a state where people want to move here. But it's not just about budgets. It's not just about money. It's about family life. It's about all the amenities that we want as, uh, as citizens and as uh, residents of Texas. Um, we know what, what Rick Perry has been doing has been working, and, and he's spent a lot of time going across the country taking a lot of abuse. But once they get here, and I know as a pastor, many folks are moving to my church, they tell me that we are nothing like California, we're nothing like Florida, we're nothing like Michigan. They love to be here because they have freedom, and they have free enterprise. They have an opportunity here in Texas that they have nowhere else. Matter of fact, as Barry Smitherman was saying in the meeting a couple of weeks ago, that in Texas, if you are graduating, if you have a student in school, they're graduating university, whether in state or out of state, Texas is the place to come back to get a job because the business climate here is so optimistic and so promising for graduates that are looking to start careers. Montgomery County 
is again the garden district of the state where everybody wants to move to Montgomery County, not because of our commissioner's court, the, the way we're working to try to solve our issues and try to work together. In Montgomery County, we've got to do that. We are pulling together. We know that we need to continue to be the garden district, the garden county in the state of Texas, not just when they move here, but they want to move to Montgomery County and that we have the, the opportunity in place for us to grow through that. With that, we can address tax issues, we can address education issues, we can address all the other climate that we want for people to live fruitful and prosperous lives right here in Montgomery County. And Mr. Hamm, state funds for uh, economic development incentives. I'm probably going to agree with uh, Mr. Millsaps down here. I'm okay with our governor flying around the country, uh, bringing businesses here. We're the leading, we're the leading state in the nation for jobs. Uh, it scares me when blue state companies move in, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's that's my own issue. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I, I, I'm. Uh, I don't think we ought to give tax incentives to big companies to move to Texas. I, I think once they get here, they're going to see the tax incentives to be here. Mr. Lewis, I have a question on state funds for economic development incentives. Well, I'm, I'm going to disagree with both Jason and Wayne. I'm not sure I heard the answer from uh, from Ted, but I, I do agree with that that we need to take the initiative to bring companies to Texas. We've seen it in Montgomery County for the last 25 or 30 years. There were those initiatives and those incentives that brought companies here, brought employees here, brought new home sales here, uh, brought shopping. Uh, the example is in Montgomery County providing support to bring Anadarko here and the number of jobs they bring here. Uh, I think you have other examples with other large corporations, not only here in Montgomery County, but throughout the state. So yes, I, I think that you examine the, the uh, demands that are, that are put upon the, the, the system and how are we going to recruit that over a long period of time. I think that there's a, a, uh, an easy way to assure that those jobs stay here uh, through those, those uh, contractual uh, means that bring them here, but uh, I'm going to be adamant that I think uh, economic development is one of those functions that the state should be participating in. And, well, Mr. Metcalf, and you can have your rebuttal, okay? So, Mr. Metcalf, you'll have the next to the last word on, uh, on the economic development funding from the state. Well, you go ahead and do the rebuttals after everybody has a chance. Go ahead. Thank you. As I stated in my opening remarks, I serve on the Conroe Industrial Development Corporation. I'm also finance chair for that board. I'm also part of the Greater Conroe Economic Development Council. That's what we do is economic development. We're a member of the Texas One program that is headed by the state of Texas and our governor travels the country and I, I think it does a great job. And Larry Calhoun, our executive director at CIDC and GCEDC, he goes on these trips. He goes all across the United States, he goes all across the world. He just got back from Egypt a few weeks ago. So it does work and, you know, for example, we wouldn't have halt the heavy equipment industry in Seguin, Texas. We would not have our industrial park that we started developing in the late 90s. It's almost sold out. We've got extra acreage, thank goodness. And us personally at the CIDC level and GCEDC level, we just developed a technology park, which is right by our Lone Star Executive Airport. So I'm in favor of tax incentives uh, as far as abatements go, because it does generate jobs for our local communities. Mr. Andrew, you wanted to say something else? Well, yeah, I just wanted to be clear. We were, you were asking about the state level. That's a whole other program when, when the counties get involved to give tax incentives for businesses to get here. And I'm in favor of that. Yeah, well, it's because you know, I just won't get into your time, but yeah, the question is about the state incentives because it's, as a state rep, that's what you'll be voting on. Yeah, the county may do what it does and other local ends. We're talking about state funding for economic development. Right. Well, I just want to, I just want to state that I'm, not, I'm, I'm clear that the counties give incentives for people to move into the county. But we were talking about the state government. You bet, you bet. Bill said. These incentives that, that we're talking about here has put Montgomery County in debt, $495 billion in debt. Uh, at the state level, this money can be spent elsewhere as well. The state's $45 billion in debt. I don't think the best interest of our state is spending money trying to attract businesses 
who are begging to come here anyway without a tax incentive. We, we keep doing what we do, keep doing what we're doing, lower our taxes, go after our budget, and people will come here on their own, and the businesses will follow. Thank you, Tony. As we continue to talk about the budget and those matters, let's think about transportation funding. Uh, a number of uh, matters have been considered before the legislature recently. Uh, some folks have uh, talked about raising uh, vehicle inspection fees. Uh, there's also been a proposal to raise uh, registration fees. Also, the gasoline tax, which would allow to fund a uh, road somewhat, uh, is not based on the price, it's based on the gallon. It hasn't been raised since 1991. So a lot of folks are in favor of raising the gas tax or indexing the gas tax to inflation. There's other proposals like taking the existing revenue and putting it over into transportation. So uh, tell us what you think about the, uh, our needs for transportation and uh, where we might find some more funds, whether that's moving it from somewhere else or new revenue. Um, just tell us what you think about it. It's a big issue and it's Dr. Siegel's turn to go first. So on transportation funding. Yeah, I, I'm intrigued uh, by Jason's thought and he makes a great point that in, in Texas, uh, we're the number two, uh, and totally in debt, our local debt is number two uh, on, on the list. And so we, we certainly have allowed ourselves to, to spend money, to make money, and to provide for the services uh, here in our state. And, and every session when you start walking the halls and you start listening to all the conversation about how we can raise money uh, to take care of the different needs and different budget areas, and it always goes back to a uses taxes and, and especially gasoline taxes. Um, and I'm intrigued by the growth, and I don't think any of us can foresee what that's going to do. Um, but we have so many of you driving your cars every day, and we're using up X amount of gallons a day. Um, just by the fact that we're growing at 5% a year and 1,300 people a day, uh, our usage tax is going to go up. And, and again, I'm, I'm sorry I keep referring to Barry Smitherman, but he, he is the, the railroad commissioner, so he kind of knows what's going on in this area. That, that we can understand more about projected income based upon growth. Now, unfortunately, our budget is growing faster than our population in the state of Texas, which is something we've, we've got to address, and the legislators want to do that. That's been on the table many, many times, and it keeps getting pushed off the table. Uh, we can't continue to grow a budget faster than we're growing as a population, even though we are growing quickly. So I'm interested as a legislator to see what the projections from the Comptroller's Office would be to say how much money are we projecting based upon more usage and a more income from those taxes that you pay every time you buy a gallon of gas. Uh, it's, we're just looking into the future here. But